You know, I believe God is calling his church to pray. I believe he's calling us to intercede for our nation. The many, many of the things that have caused our nation to drift from God is because the church hasn't prayed. Now think about it. If, if prayer makes a difference, then we should pray more. We should lift our voice to God more. We should be praying for our nation. We should be praying for our family as well as for our friends. Now, this morning, I've entitled the message, Because God Answers Prayer. If you have your Bibles and would turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 2, we're going to be looking at verses 1 and 2. And the Word of God says this, I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings. Now, in our governmental system, that would be presidents, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. Let's pray, shall we? Father, we thank you for your word. And, Lord, it challenges us. Lord, it speaks to us. Lord, I pray that this morning it will cause us to draw closer to you and to help us to become prayer warriors for you. We give you praise for it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. You know, as we look at this passage, our first responsibility is to pray. Well, let me ask you this question. Why don't we pray more? I mean, think about it. If prayer changes things, why don't we pray more? Well, I believe it's because of a misunderstanding of theology that causes us to pray less when it should cause us to pray more. Have you ever heard that old saying that says, boy, if I know just enough about that to be dangerous. Well, unfortunately, I believe the church knows enough about that to be dangerous, to know enough about theology to, to be dangerous. And so my goal is to help you with theology and doctrine because when you understand God, when you experience uh, how powerful and mighty he is, it changes your life. And so I want to look at that word theology just for a second. Some people think that's a dirty word. I want to tell you it's a good word. And that word theology in the Greek is divided into two parts. You have theos, which means God, and you have the word logia, which means subject. Now there's Many people that would say theology means the study of God. And that would be a good working definition, but the literal uh, definition would be the subject of God or speech of God. Now, many have had classes in college, whether it's biology or geology or zoology, which means the subject of and so this is the subject of God. And when you study the subject of God, you study the characteristics of God. It's also what we call, or many call, the attributes of God. And that's very important. And the wonderful thing about the English language is this. You can, you can look at a word in the English language and find a definition of what it means by just looking at the word or breaking the word down. That word attributes uh, could be uh, called a tribute, an attribute, a tribute. When you give a tribute uh, for someone or to someone, you're talking about the characteristics of that person. In fact, you can take that word attribute and break it down further. Attribute could also include the word tribe. When you talk about a tribe, you're talking about a distinct group of characteristics about a group of people. And so when we talk about the attributes of God, 
uh, we're talking about his character, and that's what theology is about. And so this morning, I believe there are two attributes that many people misunderstand, and as a result of misunderstanding those attributes, they pray less when they should pray more. So the first attribute that I want to bring to your attention is the sovereignty of God. Now, there's a huge misunderstanding about the sovereignty of God. And people actually blame tragedies on this attribute. They say, well, we just have to trust the, the attributes, the sovereignty of God. And I believe in the sovereignty of God. I believe we should trust the sovereignty of God. But using that phrase in that context is is not what that means at all. In other words, we're blaming God for a lot of things that are happening in our world that God is not doing. And so the sovereignty of God, if you want to understand it, does not mean that God just does whatever he wants. Let's break down that word sovereign real quick. And I, I want to give you a good working definition of the word sovereign. Uh, the word sovereign, you can divide into two parts, S-O-V-E and R-E-I-G-N. Now, that word reign means exactly what it says, reign. The word S-O-V-E means supreme. And so when you put those words together, it means supreme reign. In other words, God has supreme reign. He also is the supreme ruler of the universe. Does it mean that he just does whatever he wants to do? It means he is supreme in authority. That's what that word means. But he gave stewardship of the earth to us. Now, I want you to follow me on this. Now, the problem is this. He gave to Adam and Eve, he gave them uh, the earth, the deed to the earth, but they lost it. And so, I want to take us to Jeremiah chapter 32, and I want us to look at this just real briefly before we come back to our text. And in Jeremiah chapter 32, we're going to look at it two ways. We're going to look at it at the historical exegesis, and we're going to look at the messianic exegesis. You know, the word exegesis is a critical explanation or interpretation of a text, especially scripture. That's what that word means for some of you that may not be familiar with that word exegesis. And so that word, the, the root word of that of the word exegesis is to exegete, which means to draw out, like it gives us a picture of a well with water at the bottom and to draw that water out. And that's what it gives us a kind of a, a visual or mental picture of what the word exegesis means. It, it means to draw out of scripture, to, to uh, have a a critical explanation and interpretation of what the passage is actually saying. And there are several ways to use exegesis. There's the historical exegesis. There's the messianic exegesis. There's the geographical exegesis, the location where that particular event happened. The revelation exegesis, where sometimes we don't always grasp this, but what is this passage saying personally to me. And so there are different ways to draw out what God would say to us in Scripture. And so as we look at verse 8 of Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 8, it says this, then Hamel, my uncle's son, came to me in the court of the prison according to the word of the Lord and said to me, now notice what he said, Please buy my field that is in Anathoth, uh, which is in the country of Benjamin. Now, notice this. For the right of inheritance is yours, uh, 
and the redemption is yours. And buy it for yourself. Then I knew that this was the word of the Lord. So Jeremiah already had a revelation that this was going to take place, that uh, his cousin, Hanamel, his uncle's son, would come to him. And so this was as the word of the Lord had instructed him. So verse 9 says, So I bought the field from Hanamel, the son of my uncle, who was in Anathoth and weighed out to him the money, 17 shekels of silver, and I signed the deed and sealed it, took witnesses, and weighed the money on the scales. So I took the purchase deed, now look at this, both that which was sealed according to the law and custom, and that which was Open. So I want you to see several things here. Number one, Jeremiah speaks of two deeds in this passage. He speaks of the sealed deed and the open deed. And then he speaks of two rights. He speaks of the right of inheritance and the right of redemption. So let me explain what is happening here. Now notice Jeremiah said... Hanamel, my uncle's son, that's his cousin, uh, came to me and said to me, please buy my field back. Now, what does that mean? What is he saying? Well, uh, it's probable that Jeremiah's father passed away when he was young. So his uncle came and bought a field from his mother so that the family would have resources and money to live on. Now, because this land was uh, in the family and Jeremiah was the firstborn, he had the right of redemption. When he got older, uh, he would be able to purchase this land back. Notice it also says that he has the right of inheritance. In other words, he's going to get the land back anyway. Now, it may be 10 years down the road, 20 years. It could be 30 years. Whenever the uncle passed away, he would get the land back because he had the right of inheritance. And let me explain that a little bit. There is a sealed deed and an open deed. Now, the sealed deed meant that the original family, the bloodline family, would always have a sealed deed to the land. But they also had an open deed. The open deed is if they needed money, like in this case, uh, they could sign the deed to someone and they could purchase that deed uh, and the family would have money uh, to to live on, in this case, uh, Jeremiah at the time when his father died and his brothers and were not old enough to work the land to make money. So, so anyway, the cousin comes to Jeremiah and says, look, you're old enough now. Your, your family's at a place where you could work the land and make money. Uh, you have the right of inheritance, but, you know, we don't know when that would happen, when the uncle dies you can go ahead and use your option to redeem the land back and you'd be able to have your family work the land and make money on the land. So that is the difference between a sealed deed and the open deed. Is everybody, everybody following me on that? That the sealed deed always remained with the original family, the bloodline of which Jeremiah was a part of the family. He was also the firstborn, which means he had the right, if he wanted, to purchase that land back to the family. Uh, or he could wait, and when the uncle died, that land would come back. But his cousin comes to him and says, go ahead, buy the land back. And the word of the Lord had come to Jeremiah, and there is a historical view that I want you to see. And then there's a messianic view about this passage. It's very powerful, and I want you to hang in there and stay with me. The historical view is this, that the nation of Israel would be taken captive 
they would go into bondage or captivity for 70 years in Babylon. But here's what it represented. The Lord was speaking through Jeremiah about this transaction, saying that God's people would be brought back to the land of promise and that they would own their land once again. And as we know, historically, that's exactly what happened. But there's also a messianic view that I want you to see. Here in this little passage about the, the right of inheritance and the redemption, right of redemption, the open deed and the sealed deed, we find a shadow and a type of Jesus Christ because Jesus is the firstborn and only begotten son. God gave the open deed to the earth to Adam and Eve. But listen to this, but God kept the sealed deed. And when God gave the open deed to the earth to Adam and Eve, they lost it to Satan, if you remember the garden. And when Jesus was being tempted in the wilderness, now listen to this, watch this. Uh, when, he was, when Jesus was being tempted in the wilderness, Satan, the devil, made a comment that I want you to, many of you may remember this. He said to Jesus, he said, all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor, Satan showed Jesus. Now, this is found in Matthew chapter 4, verse 8 and 9. So Satan takes Jesus and he shows him all the kingdoms of the world in their splendor. And here's what Satan said. All this I will give you if you will bow down and worship me. Now, I want you to know and take note that Jesus did not correct the devil. He didn't say, look, this isn't your... Yours to give. He didn't say you're wrong. He didn't correct the devil at all because the world was at that point lost to Satan and Satan held it. And so the devil was trying to use that as a carrot to get Jesus to bow down and worship him. So God gives the open deed to Adam and Eve. Now follow me on this. They lose it to Satan. But Jesus, who's the firstborn son, who has the right of inheritance, and it's all coming back to him one day anyway, decides to exercise his option to redeem and buy it back. And Jesus bought the authority and dominion of the world back 2,000 years ago when he died on the cross and shed his blood. We are now redeemed. He used his option as the firstborn, the only begotten son. And I couldn't help but think of Revelation chapter 5, verses 1 through 5, which is also a parallel to this. And let me read this passage to you real quick, and I think you're going to see how this parallels. And this is Revelation chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. It says, And I saw the right hand of him who sat on the throne, a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I believe that scroll that he's talking about is the sealed, um, the sealed deed. And then verse 2 says, Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seal? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open the scroll. Or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the Lion of Judah, the Root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose the seven seals. And verse 8 says, Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp. And golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. Now listen to the words of this song that they sang. 
They said, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood. In other words, he exercised the right of redemption. And out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, you have made us kings and priests to our God. Because he exercised his right of redemption, he was the firstborn. And he has redeemed us back to him. Listen to me. Here is the reason to that the sovereignty of God is a reason to pray rather than not pray because people may say, well, you know, it's just the sovereignty of God that we just need to trust in. Whatever happens will happen. No, listen, God gave us authority. We lost that authority to Satan. Jesus, the firstborn, the only begotten son, came and got it back and then gave it back to us. And notice what Jesus says, I will build my church and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. He has given us the keys, brothers and sisters. He has given us all authority so we can pray because we worship a God that can do something about it. If my people will pray, who are called by my name and humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. We are called to pray. One of the greatest weapons that you and I have is the weapon of prayer to come against any disease, to come against any wickedness, to come against anything that would confront you because you have been given the keys to bind and to loose, and all of heaven will come to your rescue. Amen. The reason to pray is, uh, is the sovereignty of God. We're praying to the one who can do something about it. Amen. Many of you may recognize the name George Mueller. He was an incredible missionary, and I'm so glad we had an opportunity to uh, have one of our missionaries share uh, a report earlier uh, in this service. But George Mueller was was most known for prayer. He lived in a very egregious, sinful life up until he was about 30 years of age, and then God got a hold of him and miraculously turned his life around, and he felt so compelled to go into the ministry. Not only that, he felt the Lord calling him to go on the mission field. And so he went to missionary school. And when he completed the missionary school, he went before the missionary board to get an assignment. But the missionary board turned him down because he lived such a wicked, sinful life earlier on. And so he went to the Lord in prayer and said, Lord, what do I do? And the Lord said, pray. And so for one solid year, George Mueller prayed. And the Lord spoke to him at the end of the year and placed on his heart a city. And so he traveled a great distance to the city, and he went to the only church that was in that city. And he knocked on the door of the church. They invited him in. He said, I'd like to speak to the pastor. And one of the people that was greeting him said, well, our pastor resigned last week. And George Mueller said, well, God has called me to the city. He's called me to the mission field, and here I am. And they said, you're hired. So George Mueller became the pastor of that church in that city. And George Mueller started a, an orphanage. And there are so many incredible stories uh, because he literally prayed that orphanage into existence. And, 
And they had uh, so many orphanages. In fact, this was in the 1800s. There have never been a missionary organization that have had more orphanages than George Mueller before or since. In fact, one story was they ran out of food. And so he had all the children come sit. He had them place plates in front of all the children with cups. They had no food. And they just began to pray. He just began to call upon God. And suddenly they heard a knock at the door. And here was some people that were bringing loads of groceries in. And they were able to feed the children because of prayer. In fact, toward the end of his life, that little church was giving $7.5 million dollars to missions. Wow. Because of prayer. Now, George Mueller had five friends. When he was living a sinful, wicked life, he had five friends that he kind of, you know, hung out with. And so when he came to know the Lord, he began to pray for these five friends. In 10 years, three of them came to know Christ, and, and gave their heart to the Lord. Twenty-five years later, the fourth uh, person, the fourth friend, came to know the Lord. Upon his deathbed, you know, George Mueller lived 52 years after he became a Christian. And on his deathbed, they said he was calling out this fifth friend to the Lord. He just kept calling out his name, kept calling out his name that he would come to know Christ, and he passed away. And so at the graveside, this fifth friend had come to pay respects, but he learned that he was calling out his name, and there knelt at the grave and gave his heart to Jesus Christ. Because God answers prayer, makes a difference. Now, the second attribute that I want you to see, and, and I believe in these attributes, but I think sometimes we misunderstand them, and it causes people to not pray when we should pray. And the second most misunderstand doctrine is this, the immutability of God. Now, look at this word, immutability. It's an important word. What does that mean, Pastor? It means simply this. Mutable means change. When you, in other words, if something is mutable, it can mutate. It can change. When you put the I-M in front of mutable, it means it cannot change. And so, the characteristics of God, the attributes of God cannot change. Let me give you a couple of examples. Malachi 3.6 says, I am the Lord, I do not change. Speaking of his character, his characteristics. James chapter 1.17 says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Let me give you that last phrase in the New Living Translation. It says it this way. He never changes or casts a shifting shadow. In other words, God never changes. Now, here's the problem. People misunderstand this doctrine and, and say God never changes so why pray? God never changes, so why pray? Well, what this means is that God never changes. Speaking of his character, his character never changes. It doesn't mean he never changes his mind. It means his character never changes. And we have instances throughout the Bible and, and it, it would take hours to go through all of them. But I've, 
I've got two instances that I want to bring to your attention. Is that, that although God's character never, ever changes, he can change his mind. Look, if you'll look with me at Moses, uh, is one of those examples. Moses went up on the mountain, remember, to get the Ten Commandments. I think many of you have watched the Ten Commandments movie. And it wasn't Charleston Heston, but Moses went up the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments. And when he gets up there, God says to Moses, go back down. The people have already sinned. They've already created this golden calf. And now they're saying that this golden calf led them out of Egypt and had them cross the Red Sea, that this golden image did it. So go down there because I'm going to destroy all of them and I'm going to start all over with you, Moses. And Moses, what did Moses do? Moses prayed. Amen. That's right. He prayed and he said, look, give these people one more chance. Don't destroy them. Give them one more chance. You can find that in Exodus chapter 32. You can read the story. I don't have time to go through the whole thing this morning. But Moses prayed and says, don't destroy them. Give them another chance. Now, notice with me Exodus chapter 32, verse 14. Now, look at this. I want you to see this. So the Lord relented from the harm which he said he would do to his people. Look at that word, relented. It's an important word. If you change one letter in that word, relented, it's, a, it's another word. If you change the L to a P, it's the word, repented. Well, you say, Pastor, God, God can't repent of sin. Well, if... That means you don't really understand the meaning of that word repent. We've heard pastors say you need to repent of your sin, turn from your sin, and that's absolutely true. You need to turn from your sin, repent of your sin, but the word repent doesn't have anything to do with sin. It means to change your mind. In fact, that word in the Hebrew is actually the same word. The word relent and the word repent are the same word. In fact, uh, this same word is used 108 times in the Old Testament. 41 times, 38% of the time, it's translated repent. The other times it's translated relent. And so sometimes that's confusing because what this means is that the Lord changed his mind from the harm which he said he would do to his people. Same word means change your mind. You know, I've had a lot of people over the years ask me about Genesis chapter 6 and verse 7. I want to use this as an opportunity to explain this because I've had so many people over the years ask me about this word. And look with me. Genesis chapter 6 and verse 7 says, And the Lord said, I will destroy man. This is during the time of Noah. Remember the Noah and the ark setting. Give you some context. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast. For it repenteth me that I have made them. And people go, "Uh uh-huh. God repented of sin. No, it means that God changed his mind about creating man because man has become so wicked. The the word there means change his mind. That's what repent means, to change one's mind. Uh, Does that mean that, that God repented of sin? No, it means he changed his mind. But notice in our text in Exodus chapter 32, And you can read it for itself, but God was going to destroy all of his people. He told Moses, I'm going to start over with you. And Moses prayed, and God 
relented. God changed his mind. And that's a reason why we should pray. Though his character never changes, God's mind can change, and he needs someone who will pray, and things can happen. The second example that I want to give you, and there are many other examples, is the, remember Jonah? All of us like Jonah and the whale. I remember working with the children's ministry, and they had this song, Go, go, Jonah, go, Jonah, go, go. We all love Jonah and the big whale, I know. Some of you are saying, no, it's not a big whale, Pastor Nate. It's a great fish. Great fish. It's amazing. However God did it, to me, it's a miracle, period. Hello? Anybody with me? Can I get an amen? Well, God tells Jonah to go to Nineveh. He gets on a ship. He goes to Tarshish, which is the opposite way. Get a map, you'll see. He's going the opposite way of God or what God told him to do. A storm comes. The sailors are terrified and frightened. They decide to throw Jonah off the ship. And a big fish comes and does what? Swallows and Jonah. And this submarine takes Jonah to the coast of Nineveh where the, the fish spews Jonah out onto the beach. I mean, can you imagine? He's kind of bleached white. He's got seaweed and stuck between his teeth. I mean, that would scare anybody. But he goes. Now, notice the instructions that God gives to Jonah. He says, you are to preach to Nineveh that in 40 days, Nineveh will be destroyed. Okay? So you know what happened? It wasn't destroyed. Do you know why? Because people repented. Okay? Look at Jonah chapter 3 verse 10 says this, then God saw their works that they turned from their evil way. Now notice our word again. God relented from the disaster that he had said he would bring upon them and he did not do it. You think Jonah would be happy about that. I mean, he just preached a great revival and the people turned from their wickedness. You'd think he would be elated. But look at the next verse, which is chapter 1 or verse 4. It says, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly and he became angry. So he prayed to the Lord and said, ah, Lord, was not this what I said when I was still in my country. Therefore, I fled previously to Tarshish, for I know that you are, now look at this here, now we're starting to see the characteristics of God. You are gracious and merciful slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who, here's our word, relents from doing harm. Amen. See, people don't really understand why Jonah left. They think, he well, he just was being rebellious. They think, well, Jonah just didn't want to preach. They just think Jonah was fearful for his life because this was an exceedingly wicked uh, uh, community or tribe or whatever you want to call them. No, he wasn't fearful for his life. Notice what he says to God. He says, was this not what I said? I told you this would happen. I, I knew you would come. They would repent when I preached judgment. I knew they would repent. And then you would change your mind, God. You would show compassion. You would be gracious. You'd be slow to anger. You would be merciful. I knew that would happen. That's why I didn't want to go to, uh, to Nineveh. Because I knew they would repent. And you would change your mind because of your character. Long-suffering. Slow to anger. 
merciful, gracious. That's who you are, God. That is who you are. And I just think it's so remarkable that God does not change. His character will not change. But Jonah understood that his mind could change. You know, you'd think that when God says something, it's going to happen. But here is a reason. The more why we should pray, why we should intercede, why we should seek God, because he can take that circumstance and turn it around. He can change his mind. Even if he's got judgments yet, he can bring about victory. He can see you as an overcomer. He just needs someone to pray. That's what he said to Ezekiel. I saw for a man, someone who would stand in the gap Someone who would stand in the gap and make up a hedge that I would not destroy them. I just needed one person. My eye, the eye of the Lord, runs to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose hearts are toward him. God is looking for one person who will stand in the gap, who will say, here am I. I can be counted. I am going to pray and serve you, Lord. God is looking for that person. I just believe one person that was standing in agreement with God, who is the supreme ruler, whose character never changes. And so I, that's why I believe that our nation is in such trouble. Because the church has not prayed. We need to be men and women who can be counted and pray. I close with this little story, and I, I've shared this with our church before, and if you're new to our church, and um, you may not have heard this story, but it shows the power of prayer and how God answers prayer. And I'm going to make this very brief, but I was a young minister in Omaha, Nebraska, and it was my job to do hospital visitation. There was a name on the the board that I, of a man I was supposed to go see that I did not know. This is a big church, so that wasn't uncommon. This person, I'll always remember, was at Methodist Hospital in Omaha, Nebraska. And I went, and at the time, beside his name, it had the word AIDS. I, I didn't know what AIDS was. It kind of was new to our world at that time. I didn't know what that meant. So I went to visit him in the hospital, and I remember knocking on the door and pushing it open a little bit, and here's a young man. He looks at me, he says, who are you? I said, well, I'm uh, one of the pastors at Bellevue Assembly of God, and he says, well, sir, you can just turn right around, kind of did his finger like that, and you can go right back out where you came from. And I said, well, I've got great news to share with you. And he said, look, I've done things so horrible, so terrible that even God can't forgive me. And I said, that's why I'm here. God wanted me to come to share with you the good news that you are exactly the person that God loves. And I I went in, I began to talk with him, and for about an hour we talked, and at the end of that time, I said, won't you give your heart to Jesus Christ? And he said, yes. And right there in that hospital room, in Methodist Hospital, a prayer went up to the living God, and this young man became gloriously saved. But it wasn't too long after that because he was in some the advanced stages and medical science really wasn't sure what this was and he passed away and so I got a call uh, to do the funeral and I accepted and the other pastors had declined which makes it more powerful of a testimony in fact I was the last one I'd never done a funeral before I was the music guy at the time and they said, would you do it? Because all the other 
pastors had other conflicts. I said, yes, I'll, I'll do it. And so uh, they gave me the number to the funeral home. I went to the funeral home. I remember walking in. I, I heard this loud crying, sobbing. I mean, I'd been to funerals, attended funerals before, but nothing like this screeching, crying. And I asked the funeral director, what's going on? And he said, well, the mother is deeply grieving. And she's laying on the floor in the front. Pastor, why don't you go talk with her? And I'm thinking to myself, they didn't prepare me in Bible college to confront this. What do you do? What do you say? How do you comfort? There's a mom who just lost her son. And so I made my way down to the front. And I just began to kneel beside her and pray. I didn't say anything. I didn't introduce myself. I just kneeled right beside her. She was actually prostrate on the floor, prostrate. And I said, well, actually, she said to me, she said, who are you? I said, well, I'm the pastor. I'm here to officiate, you know, the, the funeral. And she just began to sob more. And she said, pastor, why did God do this? I have prayed every day day for my son for 20 years to come to know him and to accept him as his personal savior and then i understood why god worked it out for me to come and officiate this funeral because the other pastors wouldn't have known this but i was able to share with that mom that i was the one who led him to Jesus Christ. And I shared that with this mother. And she began to wipe her tears and said, what, what was that? I said, I led your son to Jesus Christ shortly before he died. And I want to tell you that crying and screaming and hollering stopped. And she began to rejoice. She stood up and began to dance. To thank the living God for answering prayer. God answers prayer. Don't let the devil deceive you and make you think that God doesn't hear your prayer. It's a lie from the pit of hell. The Bible says this is our confidence that when we pray, God hears us. I want you to know God loves you and he's working in your behalf. Don't become discouraged. Well, I've been praying for this or I've been praying for that for a long time. You keep praying and watch what God does. God will answer your prayer. You may not see it in this world, it's like George Mueller didn't see his fifth friend come to know Christ, but God answered his prayer, even though they had buried him in the ground at his graveside. He came to know Christ. God answered his prayer, and God will answer your prayer. Now, we're, we're living in a season where it's very tumultuous with just so many things that are happening in our world with the coronavirus, this pandemic, and people are struggling. We have so many people unemployed. God will provide for you if you'll pray. God will meet your need, but my God shall supply all of your need according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. He will. Why? Because God answers prayer. And I just believe this morning, God had me share this message because you need to hear this word. You're that important to him. He wants you to know that he hasn't forgotten you. His eyes are upon you. 
and he will accomplish his will in your life if we'll pray. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Would you pray with me right now? Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. And Father, we ask that, Lord, you'd work a miracle in the hearts and lives of many that, that are here and that are also watching via the Internet. And Father, we pray for our nation. Father, we pray for our president and senators and congressmen. We pray for our local governments, our governors, our mayors, all the way down to the tax collector. We pray for them all, Lord. Give them wisdom. Turn our nation around. Heal our land, O oh God. Father, we are, we're calling upon you at this hour. Father, turn around this pandemic. Lord, cause people to call upon you today. And Father, if there are any that are watching or here that need to know you, Father, we just ask that you would forgive us of our sin. Lord, we change our mind of the way we've been going. We repent, in other words. And Lord, we make a choice to follow you, Lord. We make up our mind to follow you wherever you lead us. Father, we thank you for your love and your mercy. You're an awesome God. We give you praise in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Thank you for watching and being with us. Amen.